Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca Tomash and I am a poet, critic and academic. I'm currently based in York and I work at York St John University as a lecturer in creative writing. Um, I'm going to be reading to you today from my first full collection of poetry which is called Witch and it was published by Pen in the Margins in 2019. The book is interested in occult power, ritual, feminist thinking, and in a kind of global sisterhood. Um, the book started from this desire that I had to find a way of writing about the silences of female history. So these kind of huge chapters of unknowing that we have when we look back at our shared past. The millions and millions of women whose stories not only go untold, but are not recorded. Obviously, we can never tap into those stories directly. They're lost, they're gone. But I wanted to use this collection as a way of circling that void, a kind of chalk outline around the corpse, a way of thinking about what we as female and female identified people have lost in our history and to try and um, rethink and reclaim some of the energy and some of the knowledge that belongs to us. Why witchcraft? There's a lot of answers to that question um, and it will probably take much longer than I have today to go into that but it seemed to me that the witch and by which I should say I mean the kind of European mythological folkloric witch rather than witchcraft practices which are kind of current and lived in lots of places around the world at the moment. It seemed to me that this was a figure of female power that could be tapped for exciting meaning. The witch is disobedient, the witch is sexual, the witch is powerful, the witch has agency and it seemed that the force of this archetype, even though it's an archetype that's usually perceived negatively, the force of this archetype could actually reform and refigure some of the ways that we think about what it might be possible to do as someone who considers themselves female. What might, a rev what might a revolution look like if it took place according to so-called female principles? All the things that are degraded culturally softness, emotion, sexuality, fracturedness, openness, what if they became the most potent forces of all? So that's some of the things that my book is interested in. And I was really honoured to be asked to read something in response to Kobe Nell's incredible artworks. I think that Kobe and I share a lot of different affinities in our interests but not just in the sense of our interest in, in ritual and in those kind of magic structures. I think that Kobe's interest in gossip as a site of you know, potential damage for, for women, but also a site of potential liberation for women, those shared networks, which obviously have become particularly relevant you know, in this moment of Me Too, the idea that, that women and female identified people share knowledge with each other to protect each other. That idea that all the damage that's done by society and that has been done to kind of destroy women's agency and their bodies and their freedom, there has always been some network of female power and female connection that has fought back against that degradation. So I see those themes and I see those structures in Kobe's work. And so in the poems that I've chosen to read today... I've tried to not respond directly to that, of course, as a pre-existent work, but to just think about some of those themes and to pick up on them where they rise up in this particular collection. And I think as I read, you'll hopefully see those connections and you'll see that link to some of what Kobe is doing. And hopefully that will be the beginning of a kind of open consideration between our two forms of work and forms of practice. So, I am going to start by reading a poem from the witch section of my book. So I should explain, the book is divided into a more general narrative section where the central witch character moves through different places and different moments of history 
considering different feminist traditions, different sites of historical oppression and sites of historical power for for women. The second section of the book is a series of slightly disconnected spell poems in which I'm using poetic language in the form of a spell. A spell being what we consider as something in where language makes material action happen. So a spell is something in which language creates new movement or new meaning or new change, and that was an idea that I wanted to tap into with these spell poems. So I'll read from both sections, but as I say, I'm going to begin from the more narrative section. And this section centres around the European witch trials, which you will probably be familiar with. And it thinks about these, you know, historical and kind of potently traumatic events, but it also tries to bring a new perspective to those events and think through it in a slightly different way. So. Witch Europe. The witch has romantic leanings that are expended on no one apart from the petrol station boy. He gets given flowers and a few kisses because he is too small to hunt the witch. The rest of them, however, would hunt the witch. The witch would like to get some of them under her and cradle their heads on her breasts or fuck them against the arm of the sofa. The witch would like to have conversations about her favourite literary genres. The witch would like to roll a cigarette and put it in their mouths, watch the smoke curl up past grey eyes. But she isn't totally stupid. The petrol station boy looks at her tattoo and says, Cool. The witch knows all about Europe. In Europe, people are sad a lot. In Europe, there are excellent things like fiestas and shaded cupolas and places that used to be abbeys, but are now mergings between stone walls and grass and sky. In Europe, there are all these bullet holes, from burning the last lot of witches and there are military parades where the hats distract you to a certain extent from the killing element, but European rivers smell of death anyway, so you can never really forget about it. The witch records her body as local because she's extremely old underneath. The witch understands that just because you stay very still, it doesn't mean you aren't listening. It doesn't mean that you don't exist. She understands that people like fast, so she impersonates a rock and doesn't want to be liked. She impersonates a tree and fuck. She's thinking like a tree. Her mind gets green and grows and grows. When the witch was captured, they instigated a strip search. They were looking for the place that the devil had marked her with his teeth, or with his penis, or with his own devil instruments. There wasn't anything very obvious apart from a mole and a suntan mark, so they also had a look inside her, and they did find a smudge there, which the witch said was a birthmark, but no matter. They asked the witch a lot of questions about what she got up to, all the fun she had with the devil tricking people, stealing people's livestock, encouraging women to leave their husbands, turning into a panther and a brown lizard, and having sex with the devil in those forms. They asked her why she hated goodness and life, at which she couldn't help closing her eyes, and thinking of a blue wide light coming off the sea. So they pulled her eyes open, and asked her whether she knew how to make men's cocks shrivel up and fall off. The witch tells the petrol station boy about it on his break, while they both eat coconut peanut muffins. The boy has a somewhat flat and unresponsive face, which makes him easy to talk to. The witch tells him about the trial, how there were always lots of journalists there trying to take photos of the witch outside, and that inside it was quiet and sombre, with everyone in black apart from the witch, who hadn't been given anything else apart from her slip, which meant her skin prickled. At the trial, a lot of people made claims about the witch, such as that she poisoned their dogs, that she brought lightning, that she made all the girls in the town go mad and start foaming at the mouth and downing vodka, that she stole babies and ate them raw on the battlefield, that she said war and it was war. The witch tells the boy that she used to dream about a hill covered in lumps of earth. The lumps stuck up so you couldn't walk properly over the hill or sit or look at the view. Under each of the lumps someone was buried and the earth wasn't thick at all over the dead people. So the witch got on her knees and pulled some of the corpses up to the surface which were at different stages of putrefaction because she really wanted to see their faces and to remember as much as she could about their hair colour, their bone structure or clothes. 
or to fish out personal artefacts from the graves and work out their names. But the hill didn't end, and every time she pulled out a body, more stretched out in front of her, so that even though she'd looked out, was starting to blur together in her mind. The witch decided that the only thing to do was to eat some dirt from every grave, so that even if she couldn't remember who was who, then at least some of their bacteria might get inside her. So she went along and stuffed handfuls of soil into her mouth, without stopping, on and on, even though she felt sick and knew that she'd never get to everyone before night came and made it impossible. The witch is an excellent dancer, which is good, because as far as she knows, it's hard to pin down dance as a criminal act, depending upon where you do it. As its reason for occurring usually has ambiguous elements, also the witch doesn't trust the words which come out of her, which is why she stopped writing things down. Instead, there is the dancing, which she's good at without having had specific training. And also, people expect women to dance, and they expect witches to dance, so it neither confirms nor denies. She could be doing it to get sexual attention, which she isn't, but they don't know that, do they? She dances keenly and quietly with added humming to keep time. You can't belong in there, and you can't dance with her, which is the point. It's like that poem, except that she isn't the dancer. She really is, in this case, the dance. The witch has no party membership, maybe because she travels so much and finds herself interested in things like a string of red beads hanging off a fence post in very hot, dusty sunlight, peeling paint on a car that has been left to fall apart, weeds creeping through the windshield and the engine. Rows of skulls in glass cases, two men holding each other or fighting in a lit window, waking up in a boat and throwing up the sweet potato fritters from the night before, all over someone's thick, dark hair. The boy at the petrol station didn't have a lot of time left on his break, so the witch told him about the burning. The witch said if you could see inside those flames, then you would know that it wasn't just you burning with your skin peeling back in red open mouths or your eyelids crackling away in ashy slick folds, meaning you couldn't not look. You'd also know that everything else was burning too, that the sky was melting its blue fat down to black, cold, kneeling stars, that Christ's lungs were splitting under the pressure of hot blood, his words losing their oxygen and flattening out, that women's bellies were popping open ripe melons of meat onto the cobbles and high-rise balconies. You'd see the small dark core at the centre of the planet contracting into blank steel, absorbing all the matter and all the light that you had thought was spread across the universe. Okay, so as I said, I'm now going to move on to reading a few of the shorter spell poems from the collection. Spell for change. Crack goes the mountain. Blood, blood, blood. Are you scared yet? Little fishers are putting their black hands onto the earth. An opening. Smash, smash, smash. I hope you like this. Hot and wet and tired and pain. A bird grows nasty feathers. Its song is geothermal. A clever shaking wound. Spell for friendship. Utter night with bras on the floor and a container ship full. I can't wait for the memorial to do us justice. The point is, she's talking and you don't get it. When the moment comes, when everything pulls back from its sheath of flesh and the staggering weirdness flows and pulses like a lash, send her a text. You thought it'd be your mum, but like Christ, you renounce those false and precious things for a pasty agony. The end of the world, or something, with who you've chosen. Spell for women's books. The cat shit vellum, the bad storm coming in over the flatland vellum, the old murderer's vellum. The poet moves their hips like someone on a tram about to vomit. Athena, still and glacial in her blue ice bath, fresh as a painted door. Spell for sex. One damp steak, hang outside from the porch whistling into the streaked and furious night. So I'm now going to move back to some of the more narrative sections. 
and you know by this point in the books so a little bit later on um, a lot has happened but this poem is to some extent um, a sequel to Witch Europe which is the first poem I read. Witch Fire The witch lay in immense thick darkness Around her were the bones of the body she burned, let be burned and slipped off snake-like. Being witch, the witch still breathed under the pile of logs and ash at the corner of what should be known. Adjunct to her bones are the other bones. Adjunct to her skin are the other skins, the other hair and other eyes, hard globules. What dead thoughts can live down here? Someone didn't like her husband. Someone loved hers and screamed to be separated. Someone kept their own shed of goats, which they tended like children. Someone read philosophy. Someone had a tick where they kept scratching their face. Someone had a recurring dream that they were a medieval knight with clean gilt armour and their own horse and castle who rode out on adventures and would drive through the thicket branches, slapping their face, find a damsel tied up against a tree with long wavy brown hair. And when they got close, would see that they are the damsel, they are the horse, they are riding themselves, they are saving themselves. The witch is tired and at war. She hates the past and she hates the present. She hates how easy it is, how innocuous, how boring. Hates England and wants to stop at that, but finds herself hating them all. She hates the land masses of Europe, their fat seas, their pin-tip hills. She hates their verdant grasses and their polite architecture, their binaries, their sinewy rivers, their flatlands and mud and windmills and factories and press organisations and colonial bureaucracy and prisons and fellowships and barnyards and pump rooms and locks and silage plants. There is light and she loves it coming in from space, clean and sharp as an equation, light slipping under chapped eyelids, sometimes warm, sometimes cold, hint of blue roughness, of spectral red twist, of lilac blue rim, spot of green. The witch can love light, unexpected. The witch can feel it, gathering up in itself. The light is not stupid or clever. The light is an option, as yet unplanned, unknown. So I'm now going to read from a separate section in which the witch moves away from the witch Charles to a slightly more modern but equally symbolic moment in history. Witch and the Suffragettes. Again, somehow the witch finds it is about eating and not eating. They don't eat, and so they are made to eat. She asks the policeman, what is with this eating thing? But he doesn't know why. Just that when a woman eats, she's eating for the state. When she watches her friend forced to lie back and be fed, she wretches. The feeding is the same as being sick. It is the same as not being fed, because it leaves you hungry. Ghost meal fattened with air. The witch tries to listen to the feeding because it is saying something. She knows it looks like a penis being forced down her throat and she knows that they know it. The feeding wants to make things happen without desire. Weakness is too close to permeability. See through bones which are an obvious lack. Calling out empty, 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 empty. Body only small because the mind is small. There's no room for it inside. The feeding is the tipex and it says that fullness is the cover-up. When the witch is fed, she thinks how interesting it is that fullness can be so blank, groping around in the sick dark, not allowed to pour out, only allowed to take in. The witch is sad when she thinks about the suffragettes, their pale green and pink, their soft bodies and hard placards. The witch wonders what happiness could possibly look like. At some point it went wrong, and even though she's very old, she doesn't know exactly when that point was, but she's thinking that the most likely is probably Orpheus. When Orpheus was singing, it was so marvellous, and Eurydice sang too. Obviously, they were a really good couple. Back then, it was early. You could still smell the cinders coming off the Big Bang. Nothing had really fixed yet. Nothing looked lasting. Trees were improvising their places. Orpheus went back to get Eurydice from death, as we know. But he wouldn't let her make her own way out of the rubble, seek into the scratch of each step that is not knowing, always not knowing. He looked at her eyes, which were dry and dark. Her song is still down there somewhere. 
The smell of freedom is the smell of vomit. The witch can see that now. It isn't lots of clear light pouring in, gold, fantastic gold. It is vomiting all over yourself and it getting hard in the folds. It's getting your time and they don't give you anything. So you bleed down your thighs, legs sticky. So they smack when you move them, wet gloss, smell of slaughtered animals, the unclean things. It's the smell of where you're going, into the sweat of piss and cold, into the rawness where the inside comes outside, which is exactly what they hate. The smell of earth is like this. It's dirty. The rush of death is a stunt. It vibrates its own meaning which garbles and surpasses you. All of the explosions are coming out of your head, eating the words. When the houses burn, are you meant to feel sorry for it, the witch thinks. Probably yes, but obviously no. All the fires coursing up the townhouses and golf courses and morning rooms and nurseries and halls of commerce and residences were all already there, crackling and flailing and spitting. The pleasure of seeing everyone see it, their white eyes fat with flames. It is all burning. It has all been burning us. So I'm just finding the next section that I'm going to read to you. So I'm going to read two more spells. Um, a little bit of context that you might need. This spell is called Spell for Lilith and Lilith is a, a kind of apocryphal figure of Jewish mythology. She's not in the Talmud but She's in um, some kind of other mystic books, and the idea is that Lilith came before Eve. So Adam and Lilith were actually the first human beings created by God, but Lilith didn't want to obey Adam, so Adam asked for her to basically be got rid of, and she was thrown out. Eve came in, and she became a kind of demon, symbol of female disobedience and terror. Spell for Lilith. Lilith, you look so nice with that snake. Your hair curled the way a serpent might. Lilith, you are such a bad girl. I heard you like reproductive justice. I heard you like staying up all night with your lips pressed against the cracks. Lilith, can you make an owl demon, a huge one, flapping through the night with copper eyes, shrieking for our salvation, dripping internal blood all over used cars and buildings of state? Lilith. You have a really great body. You are a taunt, an unfucked thing in a realm of little bits. Lilith, please sleep in my bed at night, smelling of lavender and coal. Rub my back and look at me with an impossible black gaze. The things you have seen, a whole universe of your own making, entirely pleasure because you're made of fire. Lilith, take us back with you, sliding all over the floor, raving and screaming and very happy. The next spell poem I'm going to read also perhaps needs a little bit of context. It's called Spell for the Witch's Hammer. And the Witch's Hammer is a translation, an English translation, of uh, a book that was originally written in Latin called Maleus Maleficarum by Heinrich Kramer uh, in the 1600s. And it's basically a, a kind of witch hunting manual. As well as being a manual, it's an explanation of why witches are so evil and why they should be destroyed. And it was a very influential book and um, was even used uh, in the Salem Witch Trials, so it had a kind of long afterlife. Spell for the Witch's Hammer. A two-pronged sword to put them down. Out there, a lot of things happen. Witches undo each other, a candle in each opening. Witches wake at night and cry. Beasts with curly horns comfort them, suck gently. Witches go astray, carnality swooping and fluttering like a ragged flag. They laugh so much, covered in purple bruises, teaching tricks, GPS of the eternal flagellant light, always going home. The witch's hammer sinks into flesh, then disappears, and only mercury remains, its little peasant trail. The witches eat your book, then you than everything. So I'm going to read one more poem from the kind of central narrative section and then I'm going to finish with the final poem in the book uh, which is almost something that stands alone which I'll explain when I get there. Witch sister, a sort of woman's face, all gods in it. Dearest sister, dearest beloved, 
Marriage comes as a knife between us. We don't need it. Witch sister, passionate head and arms, excellent culottes. On the outside, can't tell if you'd see it. The way to breed magic is to put our heads together. For now, the new epoch appears. Passionate cheek and foot. What of 2,000 years for us? Giant churches and pyramids glittering in a weird, unholy air, rubbing our stomachs and laughing like dogs. Witch has many sisters. Callous hot mouth, sneaky breaths. Yes, explosions are good, mountains coming down like pebbles, but also you put a hand in her hand, which his hair turns to snakes. Terrible, terrible, and it begins. Okay, so the book begins and ends with two hexes. Um, the first is called Penis Hex, and that's the beginning of the poem, and the final poem it's called cunt hex so obviously they kind of match up together um cunt hex is about many things but if it has a kind of central theme it is solidarity between women between female identified persons but actually between anyone of whatever gender or no gender who are part of this battle against oppression part of this battle against degradation, part of this battle against, you know, capitalist heteropatriarchy, <laughs> um, but in quite a serious way, so I don't just mean in relation to political movements and political action, you know, that is crucial to the poem and to our lives, but also to the kind of minute by minute, second by second, emotional fight of trying to live differently in a system that perhaps wasn't shaped for you, um, or find new ways of being, not just as a fight, but as a kind of celebration of, you know, the potentiality of pleasure, the potentiality of sisterhood, the potentiality of a kind of new version of being together. So this is Cunt Hex. All the attention and cold love, waiting at the Finland station for the trains to rush in. Oh, this cunt is a commie, red until the very end. This cunt is a commie with its heat set onto surplus value. Be as afraid as you can be afraid. Be afraid until you tremble. The cunt wavering through concrete so hardly and so softly. Cunt hex is the very end of men. It sees you in the small eye, your badly written messages and stink of nerve gas. What is this portable transmission? What are these borders, wet and sticky to the touch, blackened tongue parts hanging off porches? The cunt eats ice cream from the clean bowl of your skull, laughing, bands together all of the hamlets with needlepoint accuracy, cries in the shower, cries onto newspapers, cries during sex, cries at passport control, cries in the sky, down in the pit, covered in swivelling, happy tar. The cunt has face turned out, has lobe switched onto rental practices, refuge with a huge heart in it. Please tell me again to my face that emotion has no place in the body of language. Please tell me again why police try and crawl, crawl up in this mouth, how it spits them out, crisping nicely. A cunt hex is a terrible thing. You are a wet bone in a pool of other bones. You can feel this in your bowels, your sunken boy womb where snow breeds. It comes in at the root of your spine. It is a temple to your beautiful self-pity. It is a temple where everything burns, where the body burns and all the deserving angels go into the pyre. Hex ends your accretion of capital. Hex hears you at night the way you fuck, pathetic and nasty. It's both weak and sort of aiming towards violent. We'll stop all that. Choke your mouth with dowsing rods. You thought there was a conspiracy of women, didn't you? You thought that. Yes, you're right, of course. We are laughing at your dick just like you assumed, but for completely different reasons. Hex from a cunt is a blue skill, essential as seabirds, meaningful aspect, good work that must be done at the level of dirt, work that must draw all the people together, all the workers, all the cunt workers taut and loosening, all the cunt workers cuntless or heavy, all the cunt workers rising up, they will put their programme of songs onto the curriculum. They will be herbivore, but really nasty, really awful. Cunt hex is a matter of fact. It is excising the bad matter, cutting away of what has gone off. Your little standards, your medley of avant-garde hits, where the world is your emotionless brunch party, where the world is what you do to it, one great battlefield heaving with unsuitably attired corpses, with all your small-type books so ugly in the way of actual plants. 
We're all so damaged and imperfect. We're all so hurt. Know that as I hex you, I hug you. Know that as you're hexed and the blood is pouring from your head and groin, that it's only because I love everything that is alive. It's only because after the source of the infection being sliced and opened up to the parched grass, it's only then that our work truly begins. Only then that the dower singers get murdered and you are allowed to breathe. A kind of tender petaled forgiveness comes in my hate for you. A forgiveness that knows how it is to hurt and hurt on when inside you turn off. The cunt has its own pink brown seashell salted brightening solution for all this. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to do this reading. Um, I'm really honoured to be invited and I'm looking forward to um, continuing to appreciate and respond to Kobe's work in the future. Thank you for your time and I hope your lockdown is going well.